welcome to today's webinar, Improve Color Quality Control with Controlled Lighting. Presenting today is Tim Mao, our Applications Engineering and Technical Support Manager at x -Rite Pantone. I'm Robert Grotan, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating, moderating today's webinar. If at any time you have any questions, please use the questions form to submit your question. We'll follow up with you after the webinar takes place. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to get things started. Thank you, Robert. Um, so let's dive right in and talk about how controlled lighting can help improve your quality control. So we're gonna start with a question. Why is visual king? Why does it matter? Um, and ultimately, it comes down to us. It's your purchase decision. You're going to make the decision about whether or not to buy something. And before you make that decision, you're going to look at it. So maybe you're going to buy this car. Let's say it's a used car. Um, obviously, that door does not match terribly well. Are you going to make the decision to buy or not because of the difference in that color that you see? Now, a lot of that's going to depend on things like price, right? How much difference is okay? Um, I'm kind of fussy. That's probably not okay for me, although um depends how much they're willing to knock the price down to account for that. Um, so it's customer defined. It's defined by each of us. And how much difference is okay also varies depending on what it is we're buying, because maybe we're not buying a car. Maybe we're buying a can of soup. Now, our decision on whether or not to buy that can of soup, if the label might be off in color slightly, um, is going to be different than our decision about buying a car. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't matter to me that the label is different. Maybe it does. Again, it's customer defined. But the point here is visual is king because appearance, the way something looks to us, says something to us about the quality of the product. So the color tells us something about the quality of the product. That car door being a different color probably doesn't make that car drive any differently. Um, the color of a label on a soup can probably doesn't make the soup taste any different um, or have any different health properties or um, any of that, but it does affect our perception of the quality of the product. That's why visual is king. So how do we deal with that? So there's three basic requirements for accurate visual assessment. The first is specifying a light source. The second is a standardized procedure, which will include specifying the light source and will also include properly maintained color standards. But we're gonna talk about those three specific things and their impact in doing good visual assessment. So first, let's talk about light sources. Color and color difference varies depending on light source. So we need to be very specific. Um, just to give you a visual example of that, we're back to a car. It's kind of a cool looking convertible here. It's all one color, looks pretty consistent. But here, it's gonna fade to a picture of that car in different light conditions. And now look at the variety of color that that same car appears, whether it's nighttime or it's noon, whether it's under fluorescent light or it's sunlight, and you can imagine we were to put it under incandescent light or LED or any other kind of light source, we're gonna get a bunch of different colors. And so obviously, if I'm going to assess the color, I need to be using whatever light source my customer is going to make the decision in. If it's the car, um, daylight's probably the most important thing because most often we're looking at cars outdoors. If it's a soup can, like from our previous example, um, that's probably under a fluorescent or an LED light um, in a store and I'm gonna care about what it looks like there. So light source is extremely important. We need to specify the light source. Um, so we're gonna walk through this divine procedures and the various things we need to do there. So the second thing after light source is the surround color. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about what's the background. I'm gonna throw up this this um, thing of Munsell N7, that's the name of that color. That is the color specified as the proper neutral color to be used when doing um, visual assessment. And if we look at, for example, an SPLQC light booth, um, its interior is painted that color. The reason we talk about that color is sometimes people need large rooms to 
um, assess their coloring, where they aren't using a booth, and then they would paint that room in the background N7. Why is it important for the surround color? Let me give you a quick example. So here's two squares right next to each other. It's obvious the one on the left is much darker than the one on the right. <clears throat> they are not exactly the same color. Now we're going to take those two squares and put them in the middle of larger squares that are also different colors. So we took the dark square and put it on the left and the light square and put it on the right. And it's obvious, even with the one on the left with a pink surround and the one on the right with a grayish surround, that the small squares look very different. But now I'm going to take the two small squares and switch them. We're going to move the dark, darker small square to the right and the lighter small square to the left. And that looks like that. Now, with those surrounds, those two center squares look very similar to one another. Granted, they're not touching each other, but you can see pretty easily that the surrounding color can have an impact on what we see. It's why we got to be very careful about using a neutral surround um, to ensure that it's not impacting our visual assessment. The next thing to focus on is viewing angle. And we're going to look at a couple of examples of ways that people will view samples. So we're assuming we're in a light booth here. The luminaire, that's the lights themselves, are sitting up straight above, shining down on the sample. There's two proper ways to view that. One is to lay the sample flat on the surface and then the observer is standing there looking at the, the sample at a 45 degree angle, um, plus or minus, um, and doing an assessment. Or we can put in, and people will do this, um, a holder that's gonna hold the sample at a 45 degree angle for the observer to look. But there's a caution if I use the um, one on the right there. And that caution is if the observers are of different heights, the angle changes. You can imagine if that same person was a foot shorter or a foot taller, we're changing their viewing angle. So people who choose to do that, um, example on the right, I have seen them actually have footstools that they use for their different height <laughs> employees to bring all their eyes to the same level to make it equal. The reason that height doesn't matter so much on the one on the left is because by simply stepping forward or backwards, people of different heights can adjust to get the angle exactly the same. And it's fairly straightforward to do that. Okay, so, but the viewing angle is something to be considered. And so we need to, when we're talking about a defined procedure, we're talking about a written specification for how we're going to assess things. So we've taken care of the light, the surround color, the angle we're gonna view. What about the observers? The people doing the test. We need to know what kind of color discrimination those people have. For example, um, there is a product, we sell it, it's called the FM100 Hue Test. It's this set of four trays of little round swatches of color, if you will. And in each of those trays, the circle of color on each end is locked in place and the others are all removable. The way you would do that, if we took that bottom tray, we would take all those circles out. You'd have a yellowish, greenish yellow on the left, a bluish green on the right, and all those other colors. And then the, the observer in a light booth, controlled environment, has to sort them so that we have a gradual hue shift from left to right. You would do that for each of the four trays, and then you can score that person to see what kind of actual color discrimination score they get. So here's an example of the colors sorted by someone with very good, um, it would be called a superior color discrimination, um, where that line is not a perfect circle. Um, we can see some little um, bump outs here. That's where they had like two, two colors reversed. They weren't in quite the right order. But that's someone with very good color discrimination. We can compare that to this, which is someone with very poor color discrimination. You can see those lines bumping way out. Obviously, you don't want a person with that kind of color discrimination assessing yellow and blue colors. Apparently, they would probably do okay with reds and greens, but with yellows and blues, they're going to have a very big problem. 
again, it's about knowing and understanding the ability of an observer to be a good color assessor. So it's critical that we know that. And then the last part is the properly maintained color standard. So let's talk about that for a moment. <clears throat> we need to protect our color standards from exposure to things like light, even, we're not just talking um, daylight or things coming through the window, even fluorescent light, whatever is shining in the room, right? Light, heat, humidity, and airborne contamination. Got to protect the standard. To do that, you need to use black plastic bags. Why black? Because it prevents light from penetrating through it. That has no plasticizer in them. So there are bags made specifically for archiving um, things like photographs. Um, you can also get non-acidic paper envelopes that are made for archiving purposes for photographs and those kinds of things are perfect for storing standards in. Um, using, believe it or not, a refrigerator or freezer will ex extend the usable life of a standard. So let's say I have three copies of the standard. One I'm going to use, I'm going to store it in, a, in an envelope or a plastic bag and only take it out when I need to use it. The others I'm going to put in a plastic bag, I'm going to seal them up, I'm going to stick them in a refrigerator or a freezer until I need to use them because it extends their life. It stops them from aging. And when possible, we want to, of course, create duplicate standards from the same production run. I can make a sample that's my, going to be my standard and it's very large and I can cut it into pieces and use them one by one um, is a great way to approach that. And then lastly, something to think about when we're with color standards is using something called a physical tolerance set. So this is an example of a Munsell color tolerance set where the swatch in the middle is my color standard and I'm gonna be doing visual assessment, but I have the chip right above the center one is my light limit and the one below it is my dark limit. And you can see to the left I have green, greener or bluer, to the right I have yellower or redder and the white areas in the middle are open spots for me to be able to lay this on top of the sample I'm assessing and say, yeah, it's a little greener than the standard, but it's not as green as the green limit, so it's acceptable. So I've, now I have a visual tolerance method. I've got a color standard that I can use um, and, and, and a way to judge my samples to see if they're acceptable or not. So real quick, um, this is a famous picture we use in many, many instances when we're talking about visual assessment. Um, this, this person is doing everything possibly wrong in visual assessment. And I put it up here just to talk about some other considerations. Obviously, you don't want to judge color when you're wearing sunglasses. Um, she's not even holding those samples inside the light booth. Um, she's got a light booth right next to an outdoor um, exposure, right, with the, with the windows. That's, a, that's not going to work. Um, you shouldn't be storing or putting anything inside your light booth other than the two samples that you are judging. Um, she's holding them in her hands at opposite or different angles is a problem. Even what she's wearing, a bright red jacket like that, um, is inappropriate for doing visual assessment. Why? Because if you're wearing a bright color, it's literally going to bleed that color into the light that you're using to assess your colors. So those yellow samples are going to look redder to her because of her red jacket. So there's many things to consider um, and you need to be aware of all of those to make things consistent. Because of course, let's say we did everything right except she's wearing the red coat. Um, she wears the red coat today and tomorrow she decides to wear a blue coat and looks at the same thing. She's gonna have a totally different um, visual um, assessment of those colors because of the difference in the coat that she's wearing. So to wrap that all up, we need clearly drafted procedures. They're a must to ensure the reduction of variables that lead to disagreement. Most of the time when two people don't agree about something, it's because one of them is doing something different. The angle is different, they didn't turn on the same light source, and so on. Okay. Light sources, number two, are critical. Avoid the temptation to quickly assess color, in quotes there, wherever you are. It's really, really tempting to have the color standard in your hand and in the sample, 
in your office or your lab or production floor or whatever and can and look at them under whatever light you're under that's a really bad idea because it starts to influence your your assessment of the color you should not look at them till you have them in the light booth in a controlled environment under the proper lighting so that your first impression your first influence of how they relate to each other is in this controlled environment so of, try to avoid that temptation and number three test and validate the light sources so you need to maintain your light booths and have them certified and validated maintain the lights themselves properly the assessors through testing like the fm100 hue test and the color standards um, to ensure that they stay consistent if you do all those things, it will bring you in a good place of doing visual assessment. So finally, um, a time for questions. As Robert mentioned at the beginning, we do have a question forum. If you would submit your questions there, we will reach back out to you to answer any and all questions you may provide. There's also some additional information on the screen here, um, how you can find us and follow us and contact us. With that, I thank you for your time today and hope that you all have a very wonderful day. Thank you.